welcome everybody to another uh, well, another episode, I suppose you could say, of the Careers with Purpose Summit. Today I'm really proud, I'm really excited to have Tom Rippin with me today. Tom is CEO of On Purpose uh, and Tom um, essentially runs On Purpose and what they do is they help people who want to enter the social entrepreneur space um, and really, as the name suggests, uh, you know, those are the kind of businesses where purpose is at the heart of, of, of what they do. And Tom really helps with people who want to make that transition into that space. So, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much, Alex, for having me. It's, it's great to be part of it. Excellent. Well, Tom, um, why don't you want to start out doing, because I've got lots of questions for you. I know we only have a short space of time to go through them. I want to get right into it and just really ask you, I mean, because I know a lot, there's lots of people out there who are trying to make the transition themselves. You've done it. You've been there and done it yourself. I just wanted to start out by asking you, how did you go about sort of un unlocking your purpose and get to the point you are today? Well, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, it's probably not a probably not a one sentence answer. Uh, and I'd also, I think the first point I'd make is that uh, I don't think I necessarily feel like I. I've unlocked my purpose at this point or that there was any particular point where I could say that I'd, I'd done that. I think it's it's probably much more of a gradual process, but but certainly happy to talk you through um, a little bit of my career and, and, and where it's taken me and, and do. some of the twists and turns on, on the way. Um, so I actually started out in, in academia. I did a bit of research after my undergraduate, did a PhD in, in cancer research. And uh, for various reasons, realized that that uh, academia was was not quite for me, uh, even though that's what I thought might be my kind of career path. Um, I guess my my kind of second really big interest was international development, uh, and I was thinking about you know how can I get into a career um, in that space, um, and figured out quite quickly that actually um, trying to go and work somewhere where I would get really good development and training and, and career progression would um, would be really helpful uh, and allow me to in the medium and longer term do more interesting things but also things that have a greater impact and so on um, and uh, I, I met or heard of a couple of people who'd, who'd gone and actually worked in the private sector first which was not something that I'd really ever considered but I guess a light got switched on which is actually um, the private sector seems to at least by reputation often have more resources to, to, to do that kind of thing in terms of development and training and maybe I should do that as well. So long story short, I, I went into management consultancy first actually, maybe like a lot of people, um, but quite explicitly with the idea of wanting to change after a few years and go into what I thought was still the international development sector. Um, Five years later, it took quite a long time, maybe longer than expected, but five years later I did change uh, and moved out of management consulting and had by that time realized that uh, where I thought I could really um, be helpful and also what I was really interested in was how could I apply commercial and business dynamics to social problems. Uh, and actually that that happened in the UK as well. And that didn't happen, have to have to be in Africa or India. And, and after all, you know, I've not I've not lived in Africa or India. Um, I don't have very much direct experience of, of that kind of context. Why should I be working there when there's there's lots of stuff to be getting on within the UK as well? Um, so I, I, I worked at Comic Relief um, for a, a short amount of time, uh, explicitly on projects that had that combination of social and commercial uh, factors. Um, I then uh, ran uh, the European team of an organization called RED, uh, which was set up to raise money to fight AIDS in Africa through kind of big corporate partnerships with organizations like American Express and Gap and Converse and so on. Um, and I was there for probably uh, somewhere between 18 months and two years. Um, and in the process of all of that, uh, I'd had in the back of my mind this idea for, for this kind of leadership program for this space, which a little bit like what I was trying to do, uh, combine social and commercial ways of working. You know, what would the leadership program for that kind of space look like? What would it look like if you didn't have to go into the kind of commercial sector or uh, other places to acquire those skills? What if you could do that in this kind of space directly? And how could I... I guess also help other people make a bit of that transition like, like I'd done myself. And so 
you know, about uh, six or seven years ago now, I, I sat down and started more seriously thinking about it on purpose and, and launched it just over uh, nearly six and a half years ago now. Excellent. And, uh, well, a, a lot of people, again, struggle with uh, knowing what's right for them. How did you know, or did you have a particular feeling knowing that this was right for you? Mm. That's, a, that's a really good question, because I... I I'd say I probably didn't, <laughs> and uh, you know, one of the one of the big questions I had, you know, all uh, much of the way through that transition, and certainly um, when I was still working as a management consultant and at Comic Relief and so on, was trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do? And that, that always seemed like a bit of a big question and, and quite a scary question, and it it always felt like something that uh, I was being asked to answer for the next you know for the rest of my career and that always felt really difficult um and i had two really good pieces of advice actually from from someone at, uh, around about that time and one was you know you really don't have to figure out what you want to do for the next 20 30 years um, all you need to figure out is what you want to do for the next two to three years and that's enough uh, and if you're sufficiently excited by that go on and do it uh, if you then want to completely change tack you know you, that's that's always possible and the second thing was you know, don't overthink things. Um, it, it's very easy to try and become very rational about these things and write long lists of pros and cons of different options. Um, that's, I think, rarely how you really end up making decisions or at least getting the right input to your decisions. Um, and actually what's more, much more helpful is to go out and, and experience things, go out and meet people, uh, go and try things out, um, hang out with some people who are doing really exciting stuff and see whether you find it exciting as well. Uh, and then you'll start realizing in a much more experiential and maybe experimental way, actually what it is that really kind of, you know, lights your fire. Uh, and I think the kind of whole decision making process then, then becomes easier. Yeah, I think there's something in that because uh, people, in my experience, people who've tended to stay a long time in a role, say, you know, five, even 10 years tend to be the ones that are really disengaged and probably don't necessarily socialize in the way that you're suggesting there. I mean, do you, is there any particular, uh, well, in your, from your opinion, in terms of this problem, there seems to be a problem with disengagement at work. Is there any particular clues that you've come by or know of that, as to why that might have occurred? I think, um, why well, I think that's, that's, you know, a big question and not one that we necessarily kind of, uh, I mean, is quite in our kind of sweet spot. I have a couple of ideas, though. I wouldn't want to pretend that they're the be all and end all. I think there's certainly something around um, people identifying with what their job is doing and what their organization is doing. And I guess we would we would say, you know, that's about purpose. And do they really believe in the purpose of what their organization is trying to achieve? Uh, and within that, what's the purpose of their, you know, their own job as well and, and what they're doing? Um, so I think I think that's number one. And, and, and I think a lot of organizations struggle to articulate that very well. Um, or, you know, in, in much of the economy, um, it might actually be quite explicit that a lot of the purpose is around creating value for shareholders. <laughs> Lots of people are not very excited by that. Um, so we certainly hear that, that quite a lot in, in terms of people who apply to our program. Um, so I, I, think, I think that is certainly one, one aspect of it. Um, I think there is also a second element around this, which uh, was going through my head a minute ago, and I'm just trying to think about uh, what that is. Um, apologies, Alex. I'm slightly blanking. <laughs> Will it come back to you? Well, let, let's, let's. It might, might come back to me later on. It yeah. might come back. Let's move on yeah. to another one because I think, I mean, from the people I've spoken to who've, you know, joined entrepreneur, you know, entre social entrepreneur businesses or have become uh, business owners themselves, there seems to be a lot more energy and a lot more sort of, uh, I suppose, purpose in the way that they talk. As, this is just really a, just a very blanket, it's a blanket, it's, it's not a sort of a intelligent survey or anything like that, but just, just my experience, but there seems more excitement, more engagement. Uh, but what I'd say is, um, or what I'd ask you, is what, that this transition into 
social entrepreneur businesses? Or in fact, what is a social entrepreneur business? What is it? What is a social enterprise? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, so the, there's a there's a very wide kind of set of definitions about what is a social enterprise, and there's a big debate raging raging for it as well. And there is no one single definition. Um, you know, some people talk about it's all about how you earn your income uh, and are you dependent on grants or not. Uh, some people think it's about how your organization is owned. Um, do you have shareholders or not? And, and who are those shareholders? Uh, or how democratic is it? Uh, it can also just be purely about your mission and what are you trying to achieve? Uh, and, you know, several other factors beyond that as well. Um, so I, I think in many ways, uh, it, it's very difficult to say and there is no black and white definition. There is certainly something we would say about an organization that is primarily trying to achieve a social or environmental outcome and is trying to use commercial and business dynamics to do that, in, including the fact that they're trying to sell a product or service such that they are uh, not dependent or uh, only dependent to a certain degree on donations and grants and philanthropy. Um, there is certainly kind of at the core of it, there is something around that. Within that, though, there are lots of different variations of how that can happen. And actually, um, what I always say is I think it's much more interesting to talk about not, not so much uh, is this particular organization a social enterprise or not? You know, is it is a black or black or white or yes or no question? Um, it's actually much more interesting to think about, well, in, in what way might this organization be a social enterprise? You know, in what way does it create social value or environmental value? And in what way is it enterprising? In what way is it making use of commercial dynamics and so on? And then I think you become to you come to a much more refined way of looking at it. And you realize that there are actually lots of different categories of, of organizations that uh, have different business models, uh, none of which are necessarily better or worse, but you know you can kind of mix and match and, and have horses for courses essentially. Mm -hmm. And where did this wave of uh, social entrepreneurship come from? Is it experiencing a rena renaissance at the moment? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, you know, social enterprise has kind of been with us for for hundreds of years actually. Um, uh, although interestingly, the term hasn't, but it has its roots in. Uh, well, I mean, I've seen papers that talk about, you know, social enterprises back in the 11th century and <laughs> monasteries uh, brewing beer and uh, selling beer and using the profits for that uh, to support their social work and so on. Uh, but, you know, most people trace it back at least to the kind of start of the cooperative movement uh, in the 19th century. Uh, you then have other things like the Rantries and the Cadburys, uh, you know, trying to combine in that kind of Victorian age when there's a lot, you know, a little bit like today as well, you know, a lot of kind of systems change, a lot of change happening, a lot of um, social change happening as well. Uh, and, and how they thought about using their businesses to have a positive impact on society as well. So it kind of runs all the way through there, you know, cooperative movement, um, fair trade movement, microfinance and all the rest of it. And then the term really started coming up, certainly in the UK in the kind of mid, uh, mid to late 1990s was, I think, when, uh, for example, government started talking about it uh, more, um, yeah, more, more intensively. Um, and that's, uh, you know, and that's when it's kind of taking off. So for the last, you know, 15, 20 years, there has certainly been a bit of a renaissance, I would say. Uh, but I think it's and there's lots of new ideas and innovation going on, which is fantastic. Um, but it's also worth remembering that uh, this is actually not an entirely new phenomenon and it ha there is actually a long tradition and lots of roots. And in some ways, you know, it, it's sometimes worth even thinking about uh, rather than what we do now being the novel and the new thing, maybe what happened in the 20th century in terms of capitalism and how capitalism worked or maybe what happened in the second half of the 20th century was the kind of the, the different and the new thing. And maybe we're going back to something a bit closer to what, what used to be the case. And in your experience, Tom, um, can you or can, have you seen any sectors or industries where uh, there's, I suppose, emer I suppose emerging sectors uh, of social entrepreneurs, um, businesses? Yeah, sure. Um, this comes down a little bit to how you think about social enterprise and, and what you know, what definition you apply to it. But I would say um, th there are clearly some areas where there is there is a lot of activity happening. Um, I think one thing that currently it's worth being aware 
of around social enterprise is that a lot of ultimately a lot of its funding actually stems from government, um, government procurement or government funding in other ways. Um, and so you can trace a lot of activity to uh, where government priorities lie. So be that um, trying to work with young people to get them into jobs, for example, and, and help with employability and skills training, uh, be that around um, helping prisoners not reoffend, that kind of thing. So a lot of government priorities translate into what's happening in social enterprise as well. Um, and that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, however, I'd also say, though, that actually there's, there's a wider agenda to social enterprise. And, uh, you know, social enterprise, you, you can think of as being a, a, a way of thinking about things. Um, and you, you can essentially apply to just about well, maybe not any business, but certainly most businesses that operate in most organizations. Uh, and you can think about, well, how can I run this business, not just to make a profit um, and uh, satisfy my shareholders or, or ultimately float on the stock market, but how could I run this to also, uh, you know, have a positive impact on society or how could I maximize my positive impact on society at the same time? And so from that point, point of view, uh, uh, I think there's kind of fertile bed of innovation uh, in just about any sector you, you, you want. Okay. And have you, do, have you noticed any particular skills, traits of people entering this sector? I know you said it's, what you're saying is it's more, more of a philosophy as opposed to being a, a, a stamp on something. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, what, it's a, well, what does it take to be... It is, it's, it's, it's a really kind of fundamental question, I think, which is, does working in a social enterprise or does leading a social enterprise take a slightly different skill set from running a, inverted commas, normal business? Um, and, you know, it's, it's actually it's one thing that we're doing, we're doing quite a bit of work on and thinking about just because of where we're positioned and what we do. Um, but, uh, you know, and I certainly have some kind of hunches and some ideas around this, but it's difficult to prove these things statistically, <laughs> at least at the moment. But what, what are they? So I think um, there is certainly, and these stem from how social enterprises often run. So one thing is is certainly around requiring, a, you know, a very broad skill set. You've got to remember that as a social enterprise, you know, you have to operate quite commercially. You have to be able to run a business. You have to be able to you know, make a profit and all those kind of things. Um, so all that kind of commercial skill set you, you need. Um, but at the same time, you're also trying to create uh, explicit social impact or environmental kind of benefit as well. So that already means that you need to have quite a broad uh, skill set. That may not need to be all in one person, you know, in the CEO at the top. Um, but certainly as an organization, you need to have that kind of broad, broad outlook. Um, you know, with that comes, uh, you know, a kind of broader range of stakeholders than is than is usual, I'd say, in, in just a commercial business. Um, and being able to um, engage with those and think carefully about, uh, you know, how you're affecting them, how you want to affect them and, and how you include them in your organization as well is really critical. Um, there is clearly a kind of set of ideas around managing trade-offs, um, which you have to do in, in many social enterprises much more explicitly than if you were uh, maybe in, in a, uh, a more traditional charity or if you were in a more uh, pure kind of commercially minded business. Uh, so that's certainly something you have to be, to be very good at uh, and be comfortable with. And I think, and this is partly, you know, due to the kind of stage of the kind of social enterprise movement that we're at, you know, it's still quite young, it's quite emergent. Um, being able to deal with uncertainty, you know, a lot of social enterprises are forging a new path, they're creating new business models that haven't been tried before. Uh, it's not always um, the case that you can just emulate someone who's gone before you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're um, doing a new thing. Uh, and there's always a lot of uncertainty involved. The last thing that I think that I, I would then say, and this is maybe almost more of a wish uh, is that, you know, in a social enterprise, if you're running, working in a social enterprise or running a social enterprise, understanding uh, the kind of system that you're working in, that broader um, 
ecosystem, that broader environment of organizations, of people, of regulation, whatever it might be that you operate in, and the possibilities and power you have to potentially change that and affect that for the better, uh, and not only create positive social or environmental benefit through your own organization, but more broadly by affecting that broader system, you know, affecting other people to do the same thing, or maybe even affecting the system to the point where you're, you're changing the rules of how the system works. Um, that's another, you know, skill which is, uh, I think, important and hopefully will come kind of increasingly to the fore as well. Mm -hmm. There's a question that's just coming to my head um, mm. um, based on something you said. I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but um, you said that um, social entrepreneurship and social enterprises is, is a, quite a young, a young um, being, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and given it's been around for such a long time, why has it not probably moved forward to being a bit, you know, more mature in its uh, yeah. cycle? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, and, and yeah, and you're right to pick me up on that. I would say that the roots and the history of it are, have been around for a long time. But there has been this rena renaissance, this kind of almost a little bit of a rebirth. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, at the cooperative movement, uh, which is what a lot of people point to in terms of the origins of social enterprise, um, you know, I think that is mature, that knows how it operates and so on. And that, that is a big sector, uh, if sector is the right word. It's a big movement, uh, both in the UK and, and around the world. It employs lots and lots of people. And... Uh, I wouldn't say that that is emergent at all. That's you know, that's very well established. Um, however, this kind of new wave of, of interest and excitement that is being sparked, um, which much of the thinking comes from those older older ways of doing things or well-established ways, like the cooperative movement, like fair trade and so on, but where people are really trying to push the boundaries and saying, well, can I take some of those principles and can I apply those to other places? What happens if I do that in in finance what happens if i do that in um creating consumer goods uh what you know whatever it might be i'd say that is that feels like a new and exciting movement of pe people who also see themselves i think a little bit collectively as maybe working in quite different organizations with very different business models but still feel a certain um commitment to each other and so from that point of view that feels like a, a kind of a somewhat nascent movement still, which is still building up uh, exactly what it's going to look like, exactly the support structures that it needs. Uh, you know, there isn't that much regulation around it, for example, uh, that there aren't very many, what you call intermediaries in this sector, uh, like you might see in, in equivalent kind of, in the, the equivalent commercial space. So that's, I think, what it's about. It's, it's, it's really kind of taking those, some of those very, um, you know, that long tradition and heritage of some of those ideas. And I, I think it's being uh, kick-started into a new and exciting phase, which I hope, you know, will actually mean that it, that it really kind of balloons over the next 10, 20 years. And, uh, you know, and I think if we're going to solve some of the biggest problems that we face as a society, it's, it's going to have to. Um, so that's the, that's the exciting bit. Absolutely. And for anybody wanting to enter this space, um, this movement, um, I always suggest when you're looking for a new role or a transition that you look for the opportunities, you look for the gaps to, you know, to sort to enter in. Um, are there any particular gaps or opportunities, skill gaps or opportunities that you've noticed that um, are available? Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of uh, often people are trying to figure out, you know, what topic area should I be working in uh, you know should I be trying to do something in homelessness or should I be trying to be doing something in unemployment or whatever it is um, like I said before there are some which are kind of government priorities and there is a certain amount of funding flowing towards those um, and they're certainly worth looking at but actually more importantly I think it's I, I wouldn't necessarily start there I would start with trying to figure out what are you you know what what are you genuinely interested in you know and, and who are you as a person um and then figure out well given that you know what's the best way that i can apply myself to uh making a difference uh, maybe through this it, within this movement in that kind of way 
so which, which is really uh, which really speaks to who I am and what I want to do. Now, people often find that very difficult, and I found that very difficult at the beginning as well, because often people just applied in terms of, well, I don't know whether I'm interested in education or homelessness or healthcare. You know, I'm interested in all of those, uh, and people I think get very hung up on that particular kind of what I call the topic question, and also and 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 kind of what their passion is, uh, and I sometimes say people. Um, suffer passion paralysis. <laughs> you know, they, don't, they don't quite know, you know, which which is it that I'll be going for, and it feels like I'm choosing for the next thirty years and all that kind of thing. But actually, there's lots of other questions that you can ask yourself, which are um, sometimes just as helpful in terms of trying to narrow down where you might want to work. Which are things like, you know, what kind of role do I want? Uh, what type of organisation do I want to work in? You know, do I want to work in a big organisation or a small organisation? Do I want to be in a startup or a more established organization? Um, you know, is it all about uh, really pushing boundaries and being really innovative or making sure that something, uh, you know, that we know works really gets used as widely as, as possible? Um, there's, there's lots of different ways of kind of asking yourself what you want to do. And sometimes it's fine to say, you know what, um, I actually am not. You know, I, I can imagine working across several different types of topics, but what I'm really looking for is finding an organisation that that's set, for example, and is now you know just raring to go and is going to go from you know this this pilot project to being national within three to five years. And I really want to be part of a story that makes that happen. And actually, if you can narrow it down in that way, you know that provides a lot of uh, a lot of help and uh, becomes a lot your search then becomes a lot more clear basically um, I would there then kind of probably add on that there is one skill gap that, that we see um, and that's what we help with through our program is uh, helping people who are who have the the backgrounds and the ability and also the kind of personality types to help grow and estab uh, grow established social enterprises and really scale them. So, you know, we, we often say that um, there's been a lot of uh, investment and um, kind of talk about social entrepreneurs and people founding and starting up social enterprises. And actually, that's been really successful. It's amazing. We have thousands of inno innovations and innovative ideas being started up around the country now, and that's, that's incredible. But actually... If you think about it, how many kind of national or international social enterprises can you name? You know, most people struggle to kind of come up mm. with more than two or three of those, Absolutely. Uh, if, if even one. Um, and we think that part of the reason why uh, people don't can't name that many is what well, is partly that there aren't that many, and, and that in turn actually relates to the fact that. Um, uh, that because of historically focusing so much on entrepreneurs, we actually haven't spent enough time recruiting people who can help scale and, and grow organizations. Uh, these people are not better or worse than entrepreneurs, they're just different. It's, a, it's often different personality types. These people are CEO, you know, people who will become CEOs at a second or third stage of an organization rather than the person who maybe has the founding ideas and can get it off the, off the floor. And certainly finding people who, who have that kind of very solid skill set um, maybe who have worked in large organizations and therefore know what a bigger organization looks like, uh, you know, what do processes and, and, and systems and so on look like in a, in a more mature, more established organizations. We think kind of that the social enterprise movement needs more of those kind of people and that's where therefore we also focus our efforts. Mm -hmm. And you've covered some of the, I suppose, the, the skills, the, you know, the, the mindset issues. Are there, with On Purpose then, um, is there anything more that people should consider if they're wanting to join your program? Are there any sort of prerequisites at all for joining? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I should maybe just give a kind of a short overview of what the program is. Please do, um, yes. But for the for the associate program that we've been running for the past uh, you know six and a half years now, uh, it's it's a one year program for um, people who are wanting to change careers and, and switch into this uh, social enterprise movement or purpose led business movement. Uh, it combines uh, four things, you know, two six-month placements um, at organizations 
that are actually quite diverse, ranging all the way from big corporates who are doing social stuff to social enterprises to charities who are doing commercial things. Um, so you get you get to see two organizations work very practically with them and get paid for that work whilst you're doing it as well. Um, you get a half a day week of training, secondly. Um, so a little bit like a kind of mini social enterprise MBA um, taught by you know a, a large network of volunteers that we have from commercial people through to you know people from the social enterprise space. And you get to you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention, both from a mentor and a and a coach as well, which are the kind of third and fourth elements. But actually, most importantly, what on purpose is, is is a community of people who are trying to bring about this this new way of, of if you like, organising our economy, where purpose and profits are dealt with in a slightly more balanced way than maybe has been for the last uh, certainly kind of um, several decades. And uh, yeah, trying to help us all move in that direction and, and create, you know, a, a more sustainable world, more sustainably, sustainable from a social, environmental, but also economic uh, point of view. So that's, that's uh, you know, very roughly what the programme is. Uh, in terms of kind of prerequisites, um, you know, we look for people who have, uh, on average, they have about five to seven years work experience. Um, we specify a minimum of two. We don't actually ma mind where people have worked before, uh, as long as it looks interesting and exciting. Um, quite a lot of them come from the private sector, but we also have people from the public sector and the kind of non-profit sector joining the program. And we then select them based on what we call intrinsic abilities. So that involves things like problem solving, interpersonal skills, kind of motivation and persistence, attitudes and behaviours and so on. And we, you know, we take people through some quite stringent interviews uh, around that. And ultimately, about 10% of people who apply get onto the programme. But basically, you know, we think uh, that we want to find people who have the real potential to be future leaders of this kind of movement who will help contribute to building this kind of new economy or this new society, whatever we want to call it, uh, and, and have the right kind of, uh, yeah, have those kind of intrinsic skills to be able to do that. In terms of then actually having knowledge or experience of already working in that, in that space, we think that's something that we can help people with during the program, and that, that in fact is what the program is there for that you can get up to speed on that uh, relatively quickly. Sorry, Tom, I lost you for a minute there. So I was just saying that you know the the um, the we, we look for people who have these uh, kind of in, this intrinsic potential, I suppose, uh, and not so much pre-existing knowledge or experience, because actually for the you know, we we think that we can get people. On the experience and on the on the knowledge side of things, up to speed relatively quickly during the program. That's what the program's there for. Um, but it, so we're really looking for people with the potential to be future leaders in this really exciting space. Okay. And what types of companies are you working for? Can you name any of them? Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, I mean, we, as I say, we we work with a wide range of organisations. The common thread with all of them is that. Uh, the work that our participants do in these in these companies, we call the participants associates. So the work that the associates do always combines social and commercial or environmental and commercial ways of working. Uh, but to give you a couple of examples, uh, we work with big corporates like uh, Ben and Jerry's. Uh, we've worked with in the past in their social mission team, uh, but also Interface, who are one of the world's biggest um, carpet tile manufacturers and will be very well known to anyone who's into kind of sustainability and cradle-to-cradle -cradle thinking and that kind of thing. Uh, we work with uh, what I would call more classic social enterprises like HCT, uh, Hackney Community Transport, or also ECT, Ealing Community Transport, social investors like Big Society Capital and others. Uh, and then we actually also work with uh, what you might call more traditional charities, uh, again, where there is a kind of commercial angle to what they're working on. Uh, so be that in the past, Save the Children or Comic Relief, or currently also uh, something like uh, the WEA, the Workers' Educational Association. Wonderful and illustrious list there of, of people to work for. Exciting list. Yeah. And is there um, a typical uh, career path? To, you know, because we, like you said, you're creating leaders of the future. Is there a typical path to get to that particular point? A typical career path before on purpose or after on purpose, do you mean? Well, um, you know, once they're in that uh, on purpose um, framework and working towards um, yeah. Becoming, what, yeah 
what happens afterwards. Yes. Yeah, sure. So, um, so that I wouldn't say there's one typical path, but I can certainly kind of give you some examples, maybe, um, or, or to start with, maybe a couple of, of statistics. So, um, uh, the most important one is about 85 to 90 percent of people who go through the program uh, keep on working in this kind of space, in this space where you're combining social and commercial ways of working. Uh, so that's obviously great. Um, uh, a quite a significant proportion of those actually stay on in one of the two organisations they were placed in during their on-purpose year. So that's also that's obviously also uh, great when when that kind of hits off. Um, and you know, a smaller proportion, for whatever reason, might go back into a more traditional role in in a corporate or public sector, wherever it is that they came from. Uh, and that's absolutely fine as well, because actually. Um, you know, they, they remain part of our community and, and uh, they will hopefully apply some of their thinking, some of this kind of thinking, you know, wherever it is that they're working. Um, to give you a couple of examples of where people are working, though, um, ranging from, you know, large organizations to small ones again. So uh, one of our alumni uh, called Benjamin is uh, working at Virgin Unite, which is the Virgin Group's um, foundation, um, and he works closely there with the CEO of the foundation on, on a range of projects, uh, strategic projects, um, and gets involved in, in whatever needs doing. And, and if you know anything about Virgin United, they do a whole range of very exciting oh, yeah. things. <laughs> um, so that's that's one. Similarly, maybe in a, a big organizations, big corporates, uh, Ben and Jerry's social mission manager is, is, a, is an alumnus of ours. Uh, similarly, we have people working at Interface. Uh, on, for example, actually a very exciting project that uh, kind of generations of our uh, associates have worked on, uh, which is called Networks, uh, where they, short version is they use, uh, they gather discarded fishing nets around the world, um, which are made of nylon and can be an input to their carpets. Uh, so it's not only upcycling this, but also creating employment opportunities for, uh, for fishing communities uh, in, in all kinds of places around the world. Um, that's maybe kind of on the bigger side. Uh, on uh, we have people also working at um, uh, Clarity, which is uh, possibly one of the oldest social enterprises around uh, in the UK, who uh, are a soap manufacturer, um, and uh, but employ a lot of disabled people in the manufacturing of that. And recently uh, launched a kind of new uh, high-end consumer brand called the Soap Coat. Uh, and some of our alumni are involved in managing that and running that brand. Uh, two of two directors at an organisation called Teaching Leaders um, uh, are our alumni as well. Um, so that is a sister organisation, Teach First, and helps educate or train, uh, I guess, uh, teachers in schools. Um, we have someone at us uh, coming towards the smaller end of organizations now, uh, one of the partners at uh, an organization called the Social Innovation Partnership, who specialize in impact measurement and thinking very carefully about statistics and uh, and that whole big topic uh, is an alumnus of ours. Um, and uh, maybe last but not least to mention, uh, Caroline, who works at um, something called Gravity Light, uh, which is an exciting uh, small light service probably fair to say, still in the startup phase organization. Um, Gravity Light is a really exciting product. It does what it says pretty much on the tin. Um, it, uh, it uses gravity to create the light. Um, wow. uh, uh, as, as, How does it do as that? As you might have guessed. Um, well, the, the, the short version is that it, you, you basically lift up a kind of quite heavy bag of sand and rocks and so on uh, as high as you can, and, and it then drops down very... Um, very slowly down a kind of a rope uh, and that creates uh, that creates uh, obviously some uh, energy uh, and that is enough to power a light enough to help people with for example their, their reading or homework so in off-grid situations like in Africa. Tom we lost you for a minute would you mind just uh, repeating the name of that soap company that um, you mentioned yes, earlier of course. on please yeah well the the uh, the brand uh, is called the Soap Co uh, which is a, a new kind of exciting high-end brand, uh, which, as I say, is, is created by this organization called Clarity, uh, who employ uh, people with a range of disabilities in their factory who is creating these soaps, uh, and in particular, uh, quite a lot of blind people. Uh, so that's uh, some of our alumni are working there and, and, and helping to manage and, and uh, kind of launch what the brand has launched, but manage and scale that brand now as well. Um, yeah, there's other lots 
lots of other examples as well. We have a couple of directors uh, at a, uh, an educational organization called Teaching Leaders who are, assist a company to teach first. Um, uh, we have one of the partners at an organization called the Social Innovation Partnership um, who uh, specialize in impact measurement and being very careful about analyzing data around those kind of topics and bringing a lot of facts into that debate, which is fantastic. Uh, he's called Peter and, and he was also on, on our program. And then maybe lastly, I'll, I'll mention Caroline, uh, who works in a completely different area um, and runs an organization called uh, Gravity Light, uh, which uh, I, I might need to explain briefly, but does pretty much what it says in the tin. It's a light to use in off-grid places, uh, like in Africa uh, or, or India or other places, as is, I guess, a, an alternative to a solar light. Um, but you have a large uh, kind of bag of sand or rocks that you lift up uh, that over time drops down very slowly and powers a light, uh, you know, enough to read by or do your homework or whatever it might be. So really exciting, novel kind of product there, uh, which Caroline is helping to scale and make, uh, you know, both commercially successful and obviously a lot of difference to a lot of people's lives. And well, obviously, there's a common the common thread with all these businesses businesses is that they're helping people, and um, those people who set these types of businesses up in my mind are, are real, you know, really inspirational people. And it's good to have those inspirational people or people who inspire you as as you know as benchmarks for you to work towards. In my opinion, um, and I've always had my own. Uh, benchmarks or at least people that I've aspired to be like you know in personal and business life are there any in your you know any particular people that you uh, I guess look up to or have inspired you in your career oh wow um, there certainly are there's there's, there's I'm not sure there's people that, that uh, people might know more generally because they're often maybe colleagues that I have worked with um, or people who have worked in the same organization as me that, I, that I've known of. Um, uh, but maybe suffice to say, I can, I can mention one person who was, you know, very senior in one of the organizations that I worked in, and uh, not just in that organization, but also in the business world more generally, um, uh, you know, internationally well-known, in ways you might say very powerful but I'm not sure he would have used that word of himself uh, but what inspired me um, so amazingly about him was uh, and still is that uh, even though he is such an influential person uh, he still always took time and still takes time to know everybody's name in the office uh, to uh, ask you about your family uh, and not in a kind of passing way but with with genuine interest uh, and I think it made me realize that you know, lots of people think that maybe in business you need to have sharp elbows um, uh, to, to make it to the top uh, but this person is someone who who you know has made it to the top uh, internationally uh, and that actually you can still be a uh, you know a, a caring uh, polite extremely professional and inspiring person uh, in the business world, uh, and that those kind of qualities, in the end, you know, still really, uh, really kind of count and make a big difference to those around you. Absolutely. And just my my final question, really, because um, I, you take um, enrolment to the, the on purpose program at different periods of the year. When's the next, or when's the actual cycle? Each cycle occur. Yeah. 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 Well, th thanks for asking, Alex. So we, we have a program that starts uh, in October and we have a program that starts every April as well. Um, so uh, at the moment, we're just, we've got a few weeks left of our um, October recruitment. That'll kind of finish around about the end of May formally. Uh, and, uh, you know, our next kind of recruitment uh, for April uh, will then you know, be six months later, essentially. But what I'd say is that, you know, if someone's interested in joining the program, um, and has taken a bit of a look at the website and wants to kind of get involved, uh, even if it doesn't look like there's formally a recruitment round open at the moment, just drop us an email, uh, let us know you're keen. Uh, we might, you know, we'll, likelihood is we'll ask you for a CV. Uh, and sometimes there are also, you know, um, kind of shorter term opportunities that can come up and, and, and we'd, you know, we'd always love to hear from you. If only if it's to make sure that we let you know of the next round of recruitment.
Excellent. What's that? What's the best email to to drop the line? Um, the, the best one there probably is is uh, to be in contact what, via the website. There's an email on there, but it's basically contact at onpurpose.uk.com. Uh, and I should probably also say, uh, you know, it's the same. Uh, that's obviously for London, but uh, we also operate in Paris and Berlin. Uh, and similarly, so if you're interested in any of those cities, uh, then for um, for Paris, it's uh, contact at onpurpose.fr. Uh, and for uh, for Berlin, it's uh, contact at onpurpose.de.com. Excellent. I'm going to leave a link below as well, the video. So please also Wonderful. have a look at the website, do some research because if you're looking to transition your career, then this could be the option for you. Well, fantastic. Um, Thank you, Alex. Tom, thanks so much for your time and um, all the best with On Purpose in the future. And uh, we'll look out to see what uh, the On Purpose associates are doing uh, into the future as well. Thanks a lot, Alex. And very good speaking to you. Thanks for having me on. on the Thank program. you. Thanks so much.